Hello everyone, <clears throat> I'm from Taiping. It's a very small town up north. And I've been asked a lot of times why I write horror stories. I'll start with that. Okay, this is uh, my very first one, Big Time Stories from the Dead of Night. It was published by MPH in 2010 or 2011. And then I got into Fixie. Fixie Publishing was a KV Nightmares. There are the monsters and them horrors be everywhere. So these three, I call them the triptych of horror or terror. Okay, just for the fun of it. Now, how did I end up writing horror stories? I'm a very ordinary, regular person like any one of you, but I grew up in Taiping. So Taiping is a very small town. If you've ever been there, one of the best places for nature, the lake gardens, and sometimes it eats and all. It's uh, still very reasonable and very nice. So one of the things I always remember is when I grew up, Taiping was very scary to me. I used to live in Poko Assam. If you know Taiping, the whereabouts. Yeah. And my relatives, they live in Assam Kumbang. So it's quite a distance. In those days, I always remember Taiping is very dark. The street lights are very dim and very few. And you know, most of the roads were lined with trees, bushes, and it was not very developed then. So when I was a kid, I used to travel a lot after dinner with my family to visit my relatives from Poko Assam to Assam Kumbang. So along the way, you know, it's very dark and we have this big Awa sign, the skeleton driving. It used to frighten me a lot, like, why is the skeleton everywhere, you know, telling you with Awas and things like that. And also, whenever we go to my relative's house, this uncle of mine, he has two wives. So you can imagine, I think there were like 12 or 14 children. So that's a big group of people all around, plus my family. We'll all sit in a big circle. Then the adults will start talking as usual. They talk about that neighbor or maybe this relative. And I don't know why we always end up with ghost stories or horror stories. So when someone starts, like uh, I dare say, everyone has a ghost story to tell. So everyone, the relatives, my uncle and my auntie, my uncle and auntie, uh, supposedly they can, their third eye is open, they can see things, you know, which we don't really want to see. And everyone at all, so as a small kid, probably about six, seven years old, I was so afraid. Although there were so many people in the room, I used to crouch around near where was beside me, and I'd be like, oh my goodness, why is everyone telling me ghost stories now? And it's really dark. Maybe 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, we go back home. And they'll tell us, oh, in this coconut tree, there's this bird that will call your name, or there's this owl. So it makes things even worse. When I reach back home, and back then, I experienced this before, our jamban, our toilet, was outside. Yeah, our house. So you try not to have stomach ache or any one of these things. <laughs> after night or after dark. It's very scary and nobody wants to go with you. Not your siblings and your parents who have no time. So it's like, oh my goodness, you know, you have to beg them, please, you know, come with me. You'll be holding a candle or a torchlight and you'll be so frightened. So when I grew up, all these things frightened me so much. So I think one of the things was, it came to this book, Bedtime Stories from the Dead of Night. All these things came to me. And while I was growing up, there was all these TV series, The Twilight Zone, The Night Gallery, and The Night Stalker. I don't know why, there were so many of them. And it also frightened me. I didn't want to watch them. I was very afraid when I was a kid. Then my brother would trick me to watch it. He said, come watch with me, you know. So after watching, you know, when you want to go to bed, and my brother would say, no, you go to bed first. From the hall to the bedroom is too far, it's too dark. I will have to sit with him until the whole show is finished. So all these things, again, put a lot of ideas in my head. And I did not start out writing horror stories. I think when I was very young, probably um, primary school, I started out writing poems. I remember I wrote tragic poems. You know, sad poems, I don't know why the life is so sad. But I just write them for the fun of it. 
and you made them right. I was very fortunate because my siblings used to learn English literature. So we had kids, we had um, Shakespeare, we have all kinds of books like this poetry, literature is all over the house, it's lying around the house. Uh, Minerva's short story collection. So as a kid, I had nothing else to read, so I just pull up one, read, or my brother or sister would tell me, oh, you read this poem, it's fantastic the way he described. And then I would be like, oh my goodness, you know, like Robert Blake. So I grew up writing poems, poetry. I love doing that because I love making them rhyme. So, to speak. so after all this, and I was uh, introduced to horror, all kinds of horror, and I remember my mother, she's a typical housewife. She does all kinds of work in the house all by herself. Cooking, cleaning, preparing things for everyone. <coughs> and her escapism was uh, movies. So she would take me to the movies. Those days in Thai, we have like eight cinemas, I think, regular cinemas. We will watch something like the 2 o'clock or 2 30 show. You take the bus, go to town, and she will watch anything. So I've watched Hong Kong horror movies, you know, the really, really scary, typical long hair girl and heads coming out of the body and things like that. And then I've watched Taiwan uh, tragic love stories, I've also watched that. And my time, we also watched Hindi movies, they were so popular. We have watched uh, Hati Mary Sati, Bobby, and it was just a thing that we do, you know, movies. So my dad would bring us to see um, English movies, like Soylent Green, Planet of the Apes, and my mom would take me only because my siblings didn't want to watch Chinese movies. So I had all this kind of like, helped me with my writing. So I started off that way. And I was so interested in horror because of typing itself. Everything is so frightening. And finally, when it modernized, and we had a newspaper those days, I don't know if you remember. It was called New Trill. I love that newspaper. It's like one of those tabloids. It tells you it tell it like there's a werewolf on the loose. And this container is sighted somewhere. It's actually a newspaper, but it lasted <coughs> two months or three years. And you know, with all this, so I used to be read into it. Those days there was no internet. So all you get are all this. So I started writing. That was the time I started writing because later on in the 70s and 80s, we have a lot of big great horror movies. A lot. Just go to the video shop. It's like 80%, 90% of horror movies. So we just borrow it you know, and watch. So when I grew up all this, I started writing. I started writing. I got ideas from everywhere. I like certain ideas, so I pick it from here. I got another idea from there. I put it together. I created my own stories. So how I knew I was a, kind of like a storyteller in that sense was, when I go to school, I tell my friends horror stories. Kind of like started that way. So when I told them horror stories, they got so frightened. And then they'll be asking me, where do you hear that from? Or do you watch that? So I them, no, I created it myself. And they'd be like so intrigued. Wow, you know, it's really, really great. I was thinking maybe I could be a writer someday. So I started writing. And this one started with all those stories. I think it's out of print from NPH. So some of the stories uh, I've written, every one of the stories which I like to write is how I got the ideas. Like The Conscience of Dr. Medley. It's about someone in a confessional in a Catholic church telling the priest all these things that have done wrong. And if you are a Catholic, if you're Christian, you know that you are not allowed to tell anyone else. So to me, that is a kind of horror. If I tell you something that I've done, a crime that I've committed, it is a psychological horror. So mine is mostly to play with your mind and you know, give you thoughts and ideas. Then things like, um, for example, the rape. This, there's only this story called The Rape. Those days, that's why I read a lot of stories about rape and all that, and how the victim suffered. So I was wondering, what if the victim took revenge? Although she's dead, but she will take revenge. But she won't come back as a ghost. She'll take revenge as, is, as a dead body. So all these are just ideas I threw around. I tried writing them. And one of them here is called Under the Umbra Tree. 
I'm right in Pedongdong. Those days uh, in Poco Assam, I, I used to have this tree growing right in front of my house, Pedongdong. One of the best we've ever tasted. It's very sweet. Unlike those that you get today, very sour. Then one day, there was this infestation. Under the leaves, there was all this black substance. But when you look into it, it, it started moving. And as a curious child, I started digging the black substance and there were caterpillars underneath it. And one of my friends said, we dare not stand under the tree. It might fall on you, actually. So one of my friends challenged me. He said, well, since you write horror stories, you like telling horror stories, why don't you write one based on this tree? So I was thinking about it. I said, OK, I'll write one. So it's called Under the Umbra Tree. It's about World War II and how the war never left us. Like uh, what CP just now shared with us, every school in Malaysia is haunted. I don't know why. <laughs> Any school that you ask, uh, whatever school, they say, oh yes, the toilet, one of them. And then the school hall, the corridors. You know? So we get all these ideas. And it's a uh, tradition. Everyone, the seniors will tell you. If you're close to the teachers, they will tell you. If you're in any one of the societies, they will tell you. So this is how I grew up. So in the end, these are all where the stories landed. But of course, I changed them. Some I used uh, foreign names. Uh, because when I started, there was no fixie. And nobody published in MPH. I think Times uh, didn't even publish them. So there was no way I was going to get published. So I wrote it, being uh, influenced by American and British writers. I tried to write in that style, using British names or American names. So it started off that way. And some of the names that I used here are actually names that I found. Uh, criminals, you know, uh, politicians, the people have done wrong, so I used their names. <laughs> it kind of goes to read like, uh, in a way like karma, what would happen to them if this would happen? So along the way, and these three fixie books, the first, the second, and the third, the forest be everywhere, it's very localized now. Because since I'm writing for Fitzy, every story is, happens in different state. So one picks up one state. So one of the stories here is a, what do you call it? It takes place in Taiping. Okay, and uh, let me see. Because this was one of my experiences. It was very, very frightening, especially when you take taxi at night. And those days, I mean, Sometimes I'm very naive, you know. I take taxi and I took the train back from KL. I have to go back to Taipei. It was like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. So I took a taxi. <coughs> the cab driver was a very old man. So he took me and he took another man. This uh, big guy, so only three of us. And then this man told us, uh, told the taxi driver, I want to go to Kamonting. Kamonting and he led the driver to a very, very dark, isolated place. Suddenly, we were in between lalangs, really high lalangs, probably like almost six foot tall. So I saw the cab driver's face. He was panicked. He looked at me because I sat behind. Like, oh my goodness, where are we both going? Are we going to get into trouble? And I started panicking. Like, Why didn't I think about it? We are going to take a taxi trip on the morning. And the guy was big. He could overpower anyone at any time. So it was a very quiet journey. It was so frightening then. And suddenly we were in the middle of nowhere. Then the man said, stop him. And when I looked around, there were no houses. And suddenly he went out of the bed. And he walked between this lala and probably the house was somewhere like Kampo house. Then the cab driver was very frightened also. But lucky thing, we went back. He took me all the way back to Lake Gardens and stayed around Lake Gardens. And he said, you go in, you lock the gate, go inside your house, then only I'll go. So when he did that, I knew that at least he was also looking out for me. So these are all the experiences that I went through. I put in one of the stories here. It kind of like started, this story started that way. You know, the journey to Kamanting and what would have happened. Because if you go into Kamanting, it becomes like a very rural area and very isolated. There is nothing, no shop houses, no kampung, no nothing, no sampat, there's no street lights. So I'm just going to read a little bit from 
one of my stories here. Okay, I mean my classes. Alright. My first book from here. Okay. I'll read a little bit from this story called Best Kept Secret. Okay, when I wrote this bedtime stories, it was like uh, my teenage times and preteens. These were the ideas that I got and I got it published. And this story, Best Kept Secret, was written much later. As I grew older, I understood a lot more things, so I thought, why not write it from the perspective of an old person, which uh, I've experienced much later. So this story starts off this way. It's an old folk song. People are gathered around the old people, and then one of the old people started telling this story. The alien invasion took place in 1939. So one of the old people told the rest, and then Nurse Lemmings walked in and interrupted Jack Merrick's speech. You and your stories again? Nurse Lemmings just said he was from an island. Sava clasped her hands together in glee and announced it to the nurse. And there was an alien invasion. So is that so? It's time for your vitamins. She passed a small cup to Selva and Ingrid, who was seated in a two-seater. She then walked over to Peter, Mr. Gaddick, and Mary on the three-seater to complete her round. So where is this island they invaded? She asked Jack, who was sitting by himself. Jack smiled at the nurse and was about to respond when Mr. Gaddick barked. Hogwash. That's what it is, nothing but hogwash. Why don't you just go away then, Ingrid said. Yes, and take your hogwash with you, Mary added, and they laughed at him. Now, now, be nice. Don't let yourself get upset for no good reason. It's only a story anyway, right, Jack? They gazed at him, waiting for an answer. Right. He nodded with the obedience of a child. Finish up, everyone, before you forget. Nurse Lemming said and stood in a corner of the crowd to make sure they swallowed the liquids, capsules, or tablets, or combination of all three. The six of them managed their supplements with beverages from teacups and mugs. Okay, everyone done? Some nodded while others had said yes, but Mr. Gaddick frowned without saying anything. He watched. Nurse Lemmings walked to another group of elderly folks. None of your damn business, Mary. I can sit and complain if I want. Mr. Gaddick said hurriedly, irritated. Then we'll move to another room without you. Mary stood up to drive her point home, and Ingrid did the same. Fine, fine. Okay, I won't say anything then. Mr. Gaddick tapped his walking stick on the floor a few times and mumbled under his breath, Women. He turned to Jack and said, Go on, Jack, what are you waiting for? An invitation? Jack jumped out of the single seater and approached Mr. Gaddick with his head stretched out. I report if you lay a finger on me, Mr. Gaddick cowered away with his hands crossed over his face. And the rest guessed with surprise to see Jack reacting so strangely. Look, Jack said. Mr. Gaddick peeped through his arms but saw nothing that interested him. What? My hands. What about your hands? I don't see anything. He lowered his arms and studied the back of Jack's hands. Precisely. Jack walked around the circle to offer his hands to everyone to inspect. Hmm, Peter said. I'm sorry, Jack. My eyesight isn't what it used to be, Ingrid said. Sarah held Jack's hands into her own, drew them closer to her eyes and looked at them carefully. Your hands are smooth. Jack smiled and straightened his fingers for Mary to conclude the observation. Jack, they look younger. Jack went back to the seat and nodded. They used to be wrinkly and spotted. What did you do to your hands? Selva asked. Nothing. I noticed the change a few weeks ago when I cut myself while shaving. And the cut itself healed faster than it used to. After that, all the memories started flooding back. And my name's not Jack Merrick. It's Junji Meru. Are you sure? Ingrid said. It sounds Asian, Mary said. But you don't look Asian. What kind of a name is that? Selva asked. Well, Mr. Gary kept his walking stick on the floor. 
Are you going to tell us your story or are you going to trace the origin of your name? The island was called Best Kept Secret, but in another language which I forget now. Every morning we gathered at hilltops, we would spend time away from daily duties and enjoy the fantastic view of the ocean. I was just about 10 when it happened. Ha, ah, Mr. Garrick said. Mary grabbed Mr. Garrick's hand, which was holding the walking stick and wrapped the heart, cave heart on the floor three times. It shocked everyone, especially Mr. Garrick himself. And then the atmosphere was quiet, again on the cool Tuesday morning. We were a people of various ethnic groups and backgrounds. What I remember most was our, our conventional looking costume. Some wore flowing hand woven silk draped over our bodies like birds of paradise, while others wrapped themselves with togas and cloaks of varying lengths and fabric. Each had their own headgear and turbans, saris and gowns, ornaments and embellishments. We gathered in clusters to enjoy the breathtaking sight of the setting sun. We needed nothing from the rest of the world. We were scholars, doctors, artists, farmers, nature lovers and inventors. And we had no race because we were all keepers. I know what we are, you are thinking. It sounds like some kind of fantastic tale born out of an old man's idealistic imagination. But it's true. It came back to me one night while I was resting. So this was Jack Merrick's uh, story about how the island best kept secret was invaded by aliens. So the question was, is he telling the truth or is he seen out? The whole story is mostly based on that. And it's a very psychological story, like how it's very uh, influenced by the Twilight Zone. Okay? So these are the other stories. I have a lot of stories more to tell you, but I think we don't have much time. Just to let you know, these, two, these books are over there if you are interested. And I think that's about it. So thank you for your time.